Welcome at Flower Talk. My name is Jeroen Star. I am the sales manager for Pan American Seed in Europe. Today we are at the location of Pan American Seed in Van Aagen. I would like to introduce you to my colleague Eva van der Kruijsen from the marketing department. Welcome today at Pan American Seed's location. We are here presenting Flower Talk to you. This is our alternative to the usually hosted uh, flower trials. Today we have some great in new introductions for you and uh, all presented by our host Amanda Payne. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Amanda Payne and I'll be presenting today. I'm really looking forward to learn some new stuff about plants. I mean we're in a greenhouse, it's filled with lovely plants so can only be a good day. We're going to discuss some interesting topics for young plant growers. We're going to see some new varieties. And if you have any questions, you can ask them in our chat and we'll answer them straight away. Whether it's about um, a, a specific type of plant, um, growing plants or a specific habitat, we are here for you to answer them. So without further ado, we're going to start with a video clip starring Jeroen Star on his road trip at Florences. Here we go. Today I'm visiting Florences to show them our latest introductions. Hey Franz, how are you? Hi Jeroen, thanks, I'm fine. You? Good, good. Hey, thank you for the invite to come over and to present you our latest introductions. I've brought the E3 Easy Way with seven new colors. It's a complete new series which we introduced this year. It's a more compact growing variety, so we need less PGRs and that makes it efficient for the grower. Well, that sounds uh, very, very uh, interesting with the new one. How is it about the timing of these uh, series? Oh, it's an early flowering variety, so it flowers within 10 hours. So it fits the start of the market and the start of the season. Wow, uh, that's a really big advantage. And I also bought our latest beacon, Beacon Rose. We introduced the, the beacon over the last years. It's high resistant against downy mildew. This is our seventh color in addition, so yeah, I hope that brings something for you to, uh, to the new market. Yeah, indeed. I think the rose was one of the colors what was actually missing in that segment. So that's uh, filling another gap in the beacon and uh, hopefully it helps us to bring impatience back in all the shady places over Europe again. Bring some more color. Some more color, indeed. All right. Well, thank you, Franz. Good. Thanks, Jeroen. Thank you, Jeroen, for showing us those lovely plants. It's a great way to start off this stream. As you can see, I'm at the table, but I'm not alone. I have my guest besides me. So on my left side, I have Leon Freiland. Welcome. You're the Thank cultural you. research officer. And on my right side, Diego Pot. You're the technical support. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I think you two can tell me a bit more about plants and uh, you'll be sure to ask all the questions in the chat, right? Well, exactly. we do our best. Hopefully, yeah. Great. Um, we're going to deep dive into our first topic, which is PGRs, uh, the reduction of PGRs by alternative methods. And I believe, Leon, you can tell us a bit more about that. Well, I'm going to do my best. A reduction of chemical plant growth regulators, or PGRs. Well, in fact, I think it's more reduction of chemicals in total, uh, because when you look at sustainability, durability, uh, it's not only a part, it's not only uh, the PGRs, uh, but it's much broader. It's quite a challenge and it's, it's also quite a subject that you think, well, uh, what can we do? What do we need to do? What do our customers need to do? Uh, are there uh, difficulties for them? Do we have solutions? Well, in fact, uh, we are trying. The, the biggest difficulty is, in my opinion, that there are, well, if you look at Europe, there are several countries, several countries with their own restrictions, uh, also with their own uh, ideas about what is uh, possible to use and what isn't. That makes it difficult for us as a breeding company uh, to give good solutions for, for our customers. Mm -hmm. In some uh, countries, uh, the, uh, there are products that are banned. So that means they are not allowed in, for instance, Germany, but they are in Italy or, or Spain or France. All challenges that we look into and that we think, well, we need to, to find solutions, uh, not only for the, the chemicals, but also for the environment, for 
uh, the sustainability that we as industry also aim for and of course we as, uh, as a company. Um, when we uh, look into alternatives and uh, if you look to alternatives there are quite, quite a lot of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Of course for us as a breathing company the biggest uh, possible solution is breathing uh, varieties that are uh, compact that doesn't need uh, any chemicals to, uh, to grow or that you don't need anything to, to help the plants to be uh, as you want them. Regretfully, that isn't always possible. So we also look as an industry to uh, other alternatives. Uh, for instance, looking at biological growth regulators could be uh, on a base of algae or seaweed. Uh, there are quite a lot of tests being done with that, but it's still, still minor and we're mm -hmm. still looking into that. Other uh, possibilities are, of course, uh, trying to uh, change the method that we produce our young plants, or maybe for a grower, the, the plants they grow. If we look into that, uh, it's not always easy, but some, sometimes we're changing uh, the way of temperature, so trying to produce a, uh, a product a little bit cooler, maybe uh, a little bit drier in, in a stage three or four, not always from the start, but just the, the second part of growing a young plant. That could be already quite a different. Uh, situation. Uh, of course, we could look into the fertilizer, uh, reduce fertilizer, so the plant doesn't grow that quickly. And of course, one of the, the new topics, uh, what we look into, are uh, trying to get growth regulation through LED lights, using the spectrum to get uh, different kinds of plants. And I got quite a, a nice slide of that. And uh, this is uh, a petunia that we just tried here uh, in our facility in Van Huizen under short day and long day, but with different kinds of spectrums. Uh, mm -hmm. A spectrum with far red light and a, spect a spectrum without far red light. The, the fun part is that without far red light, uh, you can keep the plant much more compact. Uh, general, uh, a healthy plant, but a different plant habit of, uh, or shape than uh, when you use, for instance, uh, a part of far red in your light. Far red can improve the root uh, development, however, also the stretching of the plant. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what we try is to find out solutions uh, by doing tests with short day, long day. And you can see already in, uh, in the slide that, um, yeah, if, if we keep the, the petunia for this moment, uh, if we took, take a 10 hours uh, without far red light or a 10 hours with far red light, so the plant on, uh, totally on the left and the third plant that is totally different. Yeah. Similar, if you would do a long day treatment mm -hmm. for the second plant or the fourth plant, that, that it makes quite uh, a difference. It does. So with that, you, ca you can see that uh, if you do not use uh, far red light, uh, you reduce the, uh, the plant height, but also the ratio between red light, far red light is different. You use much more blue light and in, uh, in the spectrum that a plant can read, uh, that's normally the par sec uh, segment from uh, 230 to uh, say 680, 7, 720, uh, you got the blue part what realizes much more the compactness and uh, the, <clears throat> the far red part, what 
makes a plant more stretching. So for uh, cut flowers, for instance, you sometimes want to, you, to use a little bit more far red for uh, the length. But th this is just one of the, the possibilities that we look into. Uh, another uh, possibility uh, could be using the temperature. Well, what you see here is a Calibrejoa, but you also see a Perovskia. Three uh, types of plugs from Perovskia. Not all the, the same age, to be honest, but to show you the differences. If we go to the three plants of Perovskia, the left one uh, was grown cool. And with cool, I mean around 12 degrees. Uh, the right one, we used a much higher uh, temperature, around 20 degrees, and you can see uh, the internodes, so the part between the, the leaves, is much longer, much more stretched. And as a young plant grower, well, you don't want too much stressed plants, or you need to, to cut them uh, halfway. But if you have just, in general, the, the plants uh, to be controlled with a little bit a lower temperature, it helps already. The only uh, maybe problem could be it takes a little bit longer because lower temperatures uh, assures a longer time before the plant is ready to, to sell. But it is uh, also an opportunity to look different uh, to a solution uh, against the chemical uh, growth regulators. Well, besides the, the Perovskia, we also have the, the Calibrejoa. Uh, well, if we could go one slide back, maybe for the... Yeah, that one, thank you. Uh, you can see that the same what we saw with the Perovskia, we also see in the Calibrejoa. The, the plant wants to stretch. It doesn't get the optimum uh, plant habit that... Uh, a young plant grower would want or that a grower would want. So we have possibilities in steering uh, plant quality, plant habit uh, with temperature. The, the next slide we have seen uh, is what it could mean for a grower uh, at the end. So not really for the young plant grower, but what does it give for result uh, at the end for, for plants. Well, the left one was grown cool, uh, more compact, more, uh, more bushy, and the right one uh, was a little bit, bit stretch, uh, stretched, uh, also stretched, almost same words, but looks like. But you can make the difference for a grower with uh, the way you grow the, the plants. Well, at, at the end, we also have a possibility, what I said, about dry and wet. Uh, it's a begonia, and again, this is uh, a final stage, a grower stage. So not really for the young plant producer, but it's meant to show what could be uh, made by uh, using stage 3, stage 4, already uh, a little bit drier. So if you give a lot of fertilizer or you give a lot of uh, water, a plant wants to grow, especially when there is temperature enough, especially when there is uh, light enough. The plant wants to grow. So you try to trigger the plant a little bit and be a little bit mean to the young plant to make uh, the plant, well, not get stressed, but to, uh, to develop smaller uh, slower, but still okay. Well, that, that are some of the, uh, the possibilities we here in Van Huizen uh, definitely look into to, well, to try to find alternatives for uh, the chemicals. Because it's easy for us to, or easy is a big word, but we can breed compact varieties. But if it isn't possible directly, we look for the alternatives and we look for uh, the situation that we are uh, 
friendly for nature. And well, that's, that's one of the, the parts we as a company, as Pan American, uh, do look into. And if it can't be uh, done with chemicals, well, we look to, to a solution another way. Do you think it will be possible in the future? I surely think so, yeah. yeah. It, it's only a, a change, of, change of mind. Okay. And that's a big step because what you're used to do, and if you know uh, this chemical helps me to get the perfect plant, mm -hmm. uh, it sometimes is uh, difficult to, to make a change and think differently with other methods or uh, uh, other situations. The, the fact is also the retail is already telling growers, well, in total of chemicals, we want a maximum of this kind of chemical, chemicals uh, to be traceable in a plant. Mm -hmm. For That makes it also quite difficult for a grower or a young plant producer because the total in the production from uh, a seed to a, sale, a sellable plant can be X. Yeah. And if a young plant producer uses already uh, well, fertilizers, uh, growth regulators, it means the grower has less possibilities at the end. Try and use it with different methods. Yeah. Some, sometimes it's, uh, it's hard, but you look into that. And mm -hmm. as retail is telling growers more and more, well, you're allowed to deliver, but be sure. Uh, we want this. Yeah. yeah. You need to supply. Yeah. yeah. So, and if the grower gets restrictions, the young plant producer uh, gets restrictions. And, well, definitely it means for us as a breeding company uh, to do hard our best yeah. to breed something uh, what doesn't need it or as less as possible. It takes a lot of research. Uh, a little bit, yeah. A little bit, okay. <laughs> okay. Developing a new variety takes five to seven years. So if we okay. have the target to uh, breed for more compact varieties, mm -hmm. then it takes uh, quite a... It's an investment you make, yeah, but then you have something sure. at the that's end. For sure. yeah. But yeah. It, it, it takes uh, quite a bit of time. And but for the, yeah, in the meanwhile, yeah, like Leon said there, you have differ, different uh, tools in your uh, grower toolbox to control uh, the growth of your, of your plants. That's yeah. great. Thank you very much for this information. Well, yeah. my, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to our next clip. We're gonna... Climate change has been a, a big subject on global scale and in uh, the politics as well. And here in the branch of flowers, we are talking about drought and heat resistant plants. Um, it's a very popular topic and there is a lot on offer, I heard. So that's why we made this clip for you. Villa is going to tell us all about it. Here we go. Hello, my name is Willa Yu, Key Account Manager at Pan American Seed. Today, I'm going to present you two trendy hot and cool crop that can help you to respond to the challenge of global climate change. Muffle to African Marigold is a proven heat survival crop. This theory has three colors, gold, orange, yellow, and a formula mix. They are very uniform under both short and long days. Flowers keeps intense color even under extreme hot and high light condition. Thanks to its sturdy stem, Marfa 2 ships very well. The next one is a cool season crop. Clear crystal alison can be grown with no to little heat for spring pack production. Few PGRs are needed in most markets. This series has three colors, white, lavender shade, purple shade, and a well-matched formula mix. This tetrapoid alisum has larger flower and more figure than the standard diploid type, such as Easter bonnets. Pan American seed has a wide range of hot and cool crops, such as Diantha's jord and Fiolas. Please contact us for more information.
Thank you, Willa, for sharing that lovely um, information about the flowers. I love the colour of the marigold. It looks like a fresh ray of sunshine and apparently it's also resistant to a lot of rays of sunshine. So that's perfect, just like the Elysium. Thank you. Um, I believe we have some time for questions in the chat. Um, so we're waiting for those. First of all, let me ask you, um, Leon, do you think lead light can replace PGRs on the whole? Well, maybe not 100%, but I definitely think that uh, it can be one of the methods uh, to reduce the, the PGRs or to, uh, to reduce a part of the way we, we grow plants. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in, in which grade or how much it will be, future needs to tell. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of this and a bit of that, and with that you create. Yeah, it's at, at this moment we know already quite a lot about LED lights, but we don't know all. Especially mm -hmm. when you look at uh, a company like us, like uh, Pan American Seed, where we have so many different varieties, and all varieties react differently uh, about uh, the temperatures, the light, uh, the uh, the fertilizer types. So. It, it's not uh, one uh, measurement or uh, one uh, ID works for all. It's, it's just looking at each variety separately yeah. uh, and trying to, to make a tailor-made program or something that uh, would work for 85%. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in that case, we don't have any questions left on the chat, so we're going to go to our new video topic, and that is we're going to catch up on Jeroen, who is doing his road trip at Florences. So let's have a look. Hey, Jeroen. Hi, hey, Jeroen. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Good, good. Hey, thank you for the invite and the time to uh, present our latest introductions to you. I brought the products with me. So uh, as you can see, we have here the Shasta Daisy, the White Lion, yeah. which is the new version compared to the Madonna. Madonna is a little bit later. This one is 10 to 14 days earlier in flowering. A nice extra addition to the assortment. That's good. And how's the day length reaction? Yeah, that's perfect. Like I said, it's, it's early flowering, so uh, yeah, within 10 hours uh, day length, it starts to flower. So okay. it's really good for your early uh, perennial market. Yeah, yeah. big advantage. Yeah, absolutely. Good. So, and I also brought the uh, Violet Soul Bay Tiger Eye. It's a beautiful pattern in the flower. What, what do you think of that? Is that a special color for you? Yeah, that's really a special color, and I'm sure that growers like to have that next to their main colors as a specialty in the, uh, in the assortment. So it looks very nice. So yeah, we will introduce this not as an XP, but in the normal Sobe range. Well, I'm quite sure that people grow this along with the XPs and that's not a problem. It's, uh, it's a special color, so they will take it. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. And, uh, let's see what it brings us coming season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeroen, for showing us these lovely flowers. Um, I think every um, everyone would like to have them in their garden just because they're so colorful and that's Truly lovely. Um, we're going to, there's no chat questions yet, so we're going to move on to our next topic, and that is plug issues and plant diseases. I think you can tell me a bit more about them. I will mainly focus on uh, algae and fungus nuts uh, development, and, mainly, and especially uh, algae development is one of the big challenges for plug growers around the world. Okay. And especially when you have temperatures like today, mm -hmm. algae grow really fast and yep. they will grow faster than, than your crops. And in some cases they can even overgrow the young seedlings and finally yeah, compete for light, compete for fertilizer, compete for water. And finally you, you lose a big part of your uh, seedlings. And yeah, that's of course a big uh, yeah, problem, uh, especially in, in some, some conditions. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody who grows plugs uh, yeah, will recognize uh, the pictures that is in, in the slides where you see a slimy green mesh on top mm -hmm. of the trays that is totally overgrowing uh, the, the soil layer. And if it's really bad and it starts to dry out, it can even create a water repellent layer on top of the soil. Uh, so it's very hard if you irrigate from above to 
uh, yeah, re-wet your plugs again. So it, it can be really, uh, if it's out of control, it, it can really give uh, a lot of yeah, problems. problems to the, for, yeah, for the growth of the plant, but also for the grower, a big challenge to, to, to fight with. So, and it's a very common problem. And it's, I will give or share some tips, some uh, focus uh, uh, points for the, for the growers where, where to put attention to what, what is important to control algae because it's not just one thing that you need to change or adjust. It's, it's more or less like a puzzle. If all the pieces fit well, mm -hmm. then you have it under control. But if it's uh, running out of control, yeah, really hard to uh, repair it afterwards. Yeah. And it starts actually with the water source that you are using. If you're using surface water or rainwater or well water, if you have well water, normally it's free of algae, it's quite clean. But if you have surface water, there can already be algae in the water. Or if you use rainwater and you store it in an open tank or a basin, and especially in the summer, uh, yeah, there's a high risk that algae already start to develop in, in your water, like you see on the picture, where mm -hmm. the water is already completely green. When you start irrigating your plugs uh, directly with this water, yeah, you can imagine what happens. You're directly inoculating more or less your soil with, with algae uh, and yeah, they will grow very fast. So the water source and paying attention to the water source is, is a first important step. But also how do you storage the water? Uh, and we, the best way to storage the water is in a, in a covered tank or silo. It doesn't have to be inside, but inside the, you can also control the temperature of the water better, but it has to be uh, covered with uh, plastic uh, so that there is no light penetrating uh, yeah, into the water because the algae, yeah, they live from, from the sunlight. Uh, so that's, that's really important. So that's, that's the first step. The second step is well, what kind of system are you using? How are you what kind of filtration do you use? Uh, do you use filtration? Uh, some, if you don't have filtration, yeah, then there's a uh, high risk that the uh, algae can go through. But also, how do you treat your water? There are different treatment systems. Uh, UV or chlorine disinfection is mainly against diseases. But what uh, a lot of growers do is they add chlorine or uh, hydroxygen peroxide to the water to break down the algae. And it's best that if the water is coming out of your system, so if you're irrigating the plant and you measure uh, the water, you, there are uh, some strips, like you see on the picture as well on the mm -hmm. right, to measure the concentration in the water. And there should always be 1, 2 ppm of hydroxygen peroxide in the water. It helps to kill the algae uh, that are also in, in the system, in, in your irrigation pipe, in the hoses that are in the greenhouse. They are f the whole day in the full sun. That water, when it's standing still, heats up a lot and that promotes algae development even in, in, in your irrigation system, in your pipe system. You don't see uh, the, the white pipes over there. It, it, yeah. it, probably you cannot see it on the, on the camera, but <laughs> that's, that's the water system. And, uh, if, and sometimes you see that the system is not completely airtight, so that is of not light tight. So light is penetrating through the pipe if you have a cheaper quality or something like that. And then when you cut through a pipe and you check it, you already see algae development in, in the pipe. Uh, or, in, or if you cut through a hose, you can already find a slimy green substance in, in the hose, which is algae. And you can imagine each time you irrigate, you're spreading out by yourself the algae. Yeah. So by treating the water, by adding a low concentration of hydrogen peroxide, for example, you also keep your system clean, you keep your pipes clean, so you prevent it from algae developing uh, development in, in the pipe in, in your system. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful that the concentration is not too high because if the concentration is too high of the peroxide, it can also kill your crop. So you have to monitor it well. You, have, you need to have a reliable dosing uh, system that you precisely dose the, uh, the, the peroxide or the chlorine to the irrigation water. But, yeah, that's, but it's really crucial and... Yeah, you see a lot of times that there's a lot of algae development. Even when I open a hose sometimes or a, a, a breaker, yeah, you can already find the algae inside. Yeah, and then it's very easy to spread out. Because a little bit of light is already enough yeah. for algae. And, uh, algae. Especially in combination with high temperatures. And most of the time it's yeah, warm. Yeah. And if you have high light uh, conditions. Yeah. So that's the perfect habitat for algae. Yes, yes. Light and high temperatures. 
Mo and moisture. And moisture, yeah, of course. And yeah. moisture, <laughs> that's the other one. So hygiene, that's also a very important uh, part. So if your greenhouse is empty, make sure that, there, that you clean up the greenhouse, that you clean up the benches. Like you see on the picture, there is a lot of algae on the floor under the benches. Uh, there is a high risk that the algae will spread through your trays that are, or to your plugs that are on the benches. Sometimes you see green edges of algae uh, around uh, on the top of the bench or if they use some uh, cloth or cover, it's already contaminated with algae or algae are already growing on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it's very easy to come in your system to, come at, uh, to grow on the, uh, the top of the plugs. So hygiene, uh, cleaning your greenhouse yeah, is really critical to avoid yeah, each, each potential source that you have in your greenhouse. Sometimes it's even water puddles if, if you have uh, some kind of hole in the greenhouse and there is uh, standing water, yeah, that's perfect conditions. So standing still water in combination with light for algae development. How do you determine the right dose of peroxide? That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It, it also depends on, on, on the system that you have and how long is uh, the, the pipe system before the water comes out of the hose. Because if you have a small greenhouse, you, know, you can, in general, you can use uh, a lower dosage because the travel time of the water through the system is shorter than exactly. when you have a very big greenhouse. So it, it really depends on, on the situation. It also partly depends on, on the water quality that you already have. Uh, mm. if, you have if you use surface water, which is more contaminated than well water, you also need to start with a higher dosage. And there are uh, several systems on the mark, on the mark that um, they, they check the, the, the clean water, uh, the, the starting water, and they check after dosing the quality, and, and that can be monitored. Yeah. And that way you prevent if, if, if I may add, uh, normally what you look at when you use uh, water from, from a basin, uh, you look at a pH of around 6. Because uh, if you measure uh, the pH in, uh, in the water with algae, the pH is much different. And uh, trying to lower it, uh, lower it down to around 6, you also know that that reacts on the algae. Mm -hmm. So uh, to answer the question, how do you know exactly? Exactly you don't know, but that's only measuring, measuring, measuring. Yeah. But what you do know is that uh, if you count around pH 6, that's a little bit the level that you know, okay, algae is dying, uh, quality of water is okay. Mm -hmm. And I think you agree? P pH is really critical. Yeah. Uh, if the pH is getting higher and higher, then there is also more algae development. Yeah. In, in general, okay. so by controlling the pH of the water, that is also a tool that helps to control algae development. And the, the, the fun part is you can, can have the best variety, but if you're due to, to al algae not being able to grow the best plant, uh, the best variety doesn't tell you anything. It's, it's just a it's good variety but also hygiene, trying to reduce the, the problems in young plant uh, stage, like algae or, uh, well, sciara or whatever, trying to be able to grow the best young plant. So it's, uh, every step needs attention yeah. to be able to grow the best for the best, for all the best. The, all the puzzle pieces that yeah, need to fit together to make the perfect plant. And yeah. why are algae so harmful for young plants? Like I said in the beginning, they, especially on the warm temperatures, they can fully overgrow uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the seedling or in a very severe situation when you have a severe algae infection, yeah, the, you get a water repellent uh, layer on top of the soil, which makes watering the soil very difficult. So yeah. the, yeah, it's, it's competing for, for the nutrients, competing for uh, water with, with, with your seedlings. And in, in the seedling stage, yeah, the plants are Vulnerable. baby plants, they yeah. are fragile. Yeah. So yeah, if there is some competition, it makes uh, life harder for the seedling to survive. Yeah, so it's something you want to control in an early stage. Yes, yes. Because when the plant is bigger, when it's 
fast growing. The plant is finally f growing faster than the mm -hmm. algae, but especially in the early stage of the seedling development, uh, it, it's very critical to, to take care of it. It's uh, yeah. some kind of baby care, caring that you really have all the, the things uh, perfect lined up. Yeah. And algae is uh, one of the issues that can harm your seedling. And is there another issue as well? I've heard the name Skyria. Is that something you want to discuss as well? It, that is also in the later on. It's, it, they are very uh, tight related. So mm -hmm. Skiara, if you have a lot of algae, you also pro have a lot of uh, Skiara. Skiaras okay. like moist uh, conditions. And when you have the slimy layer of algae, that's a perfect growing habit for Skiara larvae as well. And they eat from, but it's later in the presentation, so I have some pictures of the, of okay. the damage. So hygiene is important, but also it already starts at the, at the sowing line, at the watering tunnel. When, when growers sow and, and they add water to the trays to stimulate germination, mm -hmm. but if they're adding too much water or if they're adding the water with a too uh, big water drip, big water drip, so that they have a lot of pressure that uh, is compacting the soil too much, the top layer of the soil, then you can already start creating an algae problem. So it's really important to pay attention that you very kindly water the trays after the, after the, after sowing, mm -hmm. with the sowing line, to, uh, yeah, to avoid compacting and that you make it too wet. Yeah. And also what you see now is, is the watering in the greenhouse. If you, in, in the very early stage with the young seedlings, you need to water with a very high speed. So it's more or less like misting uh, the seedlings, so that you give a fine mist, and in that way you, you keep the, the soil moist, but you avoid compacting of uh, the, the, the top layer. And that's why you have different type of nozzles. Growers use different type of nozzles for the different stages of the young plant production. And for the early stages, you really want to use a fine mist, a fine nozzle, mm -hmm. so that you give a, a very fine mist of, of watering. And, and in that way you avoid compacting of, of the top layer. And it's also when you water, try to dry out the top layer between your watering. So as the top layer is drying out a little bit, that is also slowing down uh, algae development. If the top layer is wet all the time because you're watering every day, yeah, then you also create the perfect conditions for algae control. So between your waterings, you want to dry out the top layer uh, a little bit. In the next slide, you see that the compacting of the soil, on the left you see a tray, a plug tray that is watered with a very coarse, heavy water, compare it with the, with the shower. On the left you used the, 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 the heavy shower, mm -hmm. and on the right you did it, did it with a fine mist. And you see already that the soil on the right picture looks more open, yeah. and on the left it's more compacted, it's, it's more closed. And the closed conditions, the compacting of the soil, are perfect conditions for algae to start developing, because the compacted soil is holding more water, is drying less quickly than the soil with a more open structure. And also the type of soil that you have use is also having an influence on the, on the development of algae. So if you have a soil that holds a lot of water, very long, yeah, there's also more risk of algae development. And we go to the trace, that's also an interesting one. I'm not sure if it's good on the picture, for us it's difficult to see, but you see on this picture trace with a lot of algae with a green uh, layer on the yeah. top, and you see trays that are uh, completely brown, that only the soil color. And this really goes back to the, the trays. Uh, the, the green ones, they are reused, they were cleaned with reused. Mm. The trays without algae, they were new. So if you reuse your trays, don't do it for crops with a long uh, crop time, because algae is mainly a problem in crops with a long uh, crop time. For example, begonias, uh, Lysiantes with uh, more than uh, uh, 7 to, to 12 weeks total production times. Yeah, the longer it takes to uh, produce the final seedling, the more risk you have on algae development. Celosia, which takes 3 weeks, it's too short, the plant is growing faster than the algae, so algae will not be a big issue. But mainly in those long production cycles, algae can be a problem. So don't use reused trays for those crops. You can use it for the short cycle crops, but not for the long cycle crops. Yeah. 
an algae develop uh, how algae uh, this is a picture with a lot of algae but you also see a lot of small black spots on the leaves yeah and then that's actually the uh, dirt of uh, the adults of Sciara, fungus nuts. And if we go to the next slide, uh, and those are really related to each other. Like I said, if you have algae, you have uh, most of the time fungus nuts. And the adults are not a problem. It's the small worms, the larvae that yeah, you see right. on the picture next to the fork. They're eating, on the, uh, eating out the growing point. They eat from the roots the new tiny roots, okay. and they can be quite devastating uh, in, in, in certain crops, uh, like Lysiantus, but also Ranunculus, that they completely eat, eat out the uh, growing point, and so that you lose your, uh, your, your seedling. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the algae of the, uh, make the perfect conditions for fungus nuts to grow, because fungus nuts, they live in the top layer, and they like wet conditions. And and that's the same condition as algae prefers. So they mostly they go yeah, hand yeah. in hand. Yeah, yeah. How to control? There are different ways to control. Like like uh, Leon mentioned before, chemical solutions are getting less and less, and uh, because there is a ban or uh, chemicals mm -hmm. are not allowed anymore. But luckily, there are several biological options, like uh, nematodes that you can apply to the soil, uh, like. Uh, uh, predatory spider mi uh, predatory mites that uh, can uh, you uh, that's what the grower on the big picture is spreading out he's spreading out the predatory mites and there is bacillus that's a uh, bacteria uh, that can be used to control the uh, fungus not actually the the, the the larvae eating the, the bacillus the bacillus get in the system and the, and, and the bacillus when it's inside it's more or less killing the, uh, the larvae. And in that way you can control the, uh, the, the fungus nuts, uh, Sciara population in your greenhouse. And another that's a mechanical is just by catching all the yellow and the blue plates mm -hmm. that you see. It's, it's sticky tape, yeah. uh, traps. Yeah, they fly on it and they are stuck. And, and each, each, each adult that you uh, catch uh, will not produce any new larvae anymore. So in that way... I have those at home because I have fungus gnats all the time. Every time I go away for a few days and I come back and there's fungus gnats everywhere. And I do use the sticky tape, but I was wondering, so how to get rid of them is probably through a natural enemy. Or throw away the dirt, so don't leave the, the garbage on, 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 uh, in the kitchen. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, so taking away, actually, yeah, the perfect conditions for mm -hmm. the, the flies, for the adult, for, uh, and the fungus nuts to grow. So yeah. uh, if you water your plants before you leave and it's water soaked, That's yeah, it's, it's, it's your way to uh, let your plants survive, yeah. but you also simulate uh, the... Uh, the perfect conditions. Yeah. But you can also, as a consumer, also buy the bacillus uh, uh, prepper. And I, may, I don't think the uh, nematodes, but the bacillus, for sure, you can... Uh, but it's, it's important with biological control you need to start early in the production. If you already have a serious infestation, it's hard to control. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a routine. You should apply it more or less every week on a frequent base so that you each time introduce new nematodes, new bacillus uh, spores that can kill uh, yeah, the larvae. The larvae. Yeah. And, and that's really critical. Start early and be consequent. Okay. I can see we have another question in the chat. Um, if temperature inside the greenhouse is above 30 degrees, uh, can we give a higher doses of peroxide in case of algae? It, it's, it's, over, it's not really related to the temperature. It's, it's how fast it's breaking down depends also on the organic pollution of your water. So if you have a lot of organic particles in the water, mm -hmm. the peroxide is reacting with those organic particles and it's breaking down more rapidly. I think that's more important than, than it's related to uh, temperature. Okay. Do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I don't think so. I, I think the, uh, the topic of uh, Diego is, is quite clear. It's, uh, he explained quite well. Uh, no, there is not much to, to add for this, uh, this moment. Okay, then I'll ask another question because we have one. What is the maximum recommended rate for H2O2 in the irrigation water? 
if you measure what is out, coming out of the hose, so if, uh, if you water, you have a breaker that is spreading the water in a nice shower. And if you measure the water that is coming out with the peroxide, you want to measure 1 to 2 ppm mm -hmm. that is coming out of the water. If it's, what's the maximum? That's also a little bit related to the, the, to the crop and, and to the, the states where you are applying it. But to be safe, we always say make sure you have a constant level of 1 to 2. Some, some hardy uh, per, uh, perennials maybe can tolerate a higher dose, maybe up to 10. But yeah, just be on the safe uh, side, uh, try to keep it within. And, and when you just start with uh, applying the, the uh, hydrogen peroxide and you need to clean up your system, yeah, in the, in, initially you will start with a higher dose to get the 1 to 2 ppm at the end of the hose. But mm -hmm. as soon as you use it for a longer period and the system is getting cleaner and cleaner, you can reduce uh, the, uh, yeah, the dosage uh, step by step. Thank you. You're um, welcome. That was the time we had for this topic. So thank you for the information. I've learned a lot. I know how to handle my fungus gnats now, so thank <laughs> you. Um, we're going to move on to the next topic, and that is a plant we've already seen before, earlier, but um, we are very excited to show you again. It's the E3 Easy Wave, um, all the way from France this time. Here we go. <laughs> Bonjour, hein, je suis Sylvia Rocheteau, responsable régionale pour Pan American Seed. Nous sommes aujourd'hui dans l'ouest de la France, chez Flora Temple, un producteur de plantes à massifs, vivaces et aromatiques du groupe Florent d'Anjou, qui produit des pétunias Easy Wave depuis de nombreuses années. Je vais vous présenter notre nouvelle série E3 Easy Wave, une évolution d'Easy Wave dans notre gamme de pétunias retombants issus de ce bout, Wave. Cette nouvelle série E3 Easy Wave est introduite pour 2022 avec 7 coloris. Tout est dans son nom, 3 E en anglais pour Early, Efficient et Evolution. Early, donc plus précoce, puisque moins sensible à la longueur du jour. Tous les coloris d'E3 Easy Wave fleurissent sous une longueur du jour inférieure ou égale à 10 heures, ce qui permet de démarrer les ventes plutôt en saison. Efficace, avec un port de plantes rond et plus compact, il nécessite moins de régulateurs de croissance. Enfin, c'est une évolution d'Easy Wave, avec une très bonne tenue en serre et sur le lieu de vente, et des performances exceptionnelles au jardin, comme toute la famille des Petunia Wave. Nous allons maintenant au chalet, sur le nouveau site d'essai de la société Grenwalls. E3 Easy Wave peut être cultivé en toute taille de contenant, en godet, comme ici en pack, également en contenant plus grand, en pot d'un litre, en jardinière et bien sûr en suspension. E3 Easy Wave, l'évolution d'Easy Wave, compacte, précoce, sans compromis sur les performances au jardin. Pour le printemps 2022, ajoutez dès maintenant le pétunia E3 Easy Wave à votre planning de production. Thank you for showing us those lovely plants all the way from our almost suddenly neighbors in France. Um, I think there's a question straight away. Will there be more colors in the future of the Easy Wave? Well, I know we're working on it. Ah, but, but it's a secret. Well, I don't think we have big secrets about it, but you always work on improvements in other colors, in uh, possibilities to uh, enlarge your, your series. Mm -hmm. But you also need to look, is there a demand for 20 or 20 plus colors. Uh, normally, I would say no. Mm -hmm. So you need to look, what's the demand of the market? And is there a special color uh, that a grower or a group of growers is looking for? Okay. Interesting, thank you. And um, we're gonna do a special topic right now. We have Shaq who is live in the greenhouse. He's gonna walk through the plants and uh, discuss and tell us a bit more about variation. So here we go, live to Shaq. And if you have questions, ask them because Shaq will answer them straight away like sort of a fire round of questions. Here we go to Shaq. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Good, eve good afternoon, good evening, good night, and good morning to all of you. My name is Sjaak Ross. I'm area manager for Pan American Seeds since some uh, 35 plus years. Uh, we all know that Pan American uh, Seed is supplying a lot of uh, high performance annuals, uh, bringing to the market a lot of color. Whether it's for garden in the shades, whether it's for your garden in the sun, whether it's for hanging baskets, packs, pots, containers, whatever, Pan American is supplying these for you. 
Join me. I uh, have the chance to introduce you or to show you three of these uh, groups of examples. Uh, first of all, our hybrida begonias. Consumers do like these begonias very much for a simple reason. You can't kill them. These varieties do uh, perform very well in stressful conditions. Therefore, they are great for landscape. For the growers, we supply full season begonias because we, uh, we offer three series, again for the grower to supply full season sales begonias. We start with the baby wing series, that's the first of the three. It comes to market with five colors, of which four are green leafed, one bronze leafed, and one of the green, le green leafed ones has a very unique pink bicolor, pink bi color, of the regular bicolor, excuse me. Uh, this baby wing series is day length neutral, which means that you can come to market uh, in only 80 days after sowing, which is great for the early season. After the baby wing, we go to the second group of our interspecific begonias, and that's the megawatt. It's a more robust plant, it's bigger, but it's again full in flowers. Uh, it comes available in three bronze leafed varieties and three green leafed varieties. One of the bronze leafed varieties is the improved pink bronze leaf that we introduced to the, uh, to the market this year. Uh, we uh, improved the one of the old one with uh, making it a more nice plant habit. Uh, we get rid of the few green off types uh, in the old one um, and the, the internodes are shorter so indeed the plant is more, more nicely shaped and we got a wonderful plant now. This is the pink bronze leaf that we introduced for this season. Uh, I can promise you for next year the much wanted and long awaited white megawatt. So that's for next year. Mm. Then we go to the last one in our three series, but certainly not the least one. And that's uh, our begonia dragon wing. By the way, the megawatt that is flowering after sowing in 100 days. So baby wing 80 days, megawatt 100 days, and then we come to dragon wing for the, for the later part of the season. This is flowering in about 120 days, but not what but, but what you get in the end is a fantastic plant with a great arching texture, which makes it fantastic and spectacular in hanging baskets. That's dragon wing. So that's three series. All the three series uh, come available in uh, good, good seed pellets, so easy to grow for the grower. Uh, make sure to keep the sowing uh, wet until the first true leaf pairs do appear. That was one. I have a question for three. you. Yeah? Um, how many pellets per plug and what plug size do you need? We advise a 288 plug, and uh, in that case, we advise one pellet a C, uh, one pellet to plug. Yeah? And um, then there's a question for Diego. How to be sure the, um, the pellet, the questions are coming in live, that's why we're still reading. Uh, Diego, how to be sure the pellet is totally dissolved? Actually, it's, it's a melting pellet. So what is critical with pelleted seed compared to raw seeds is that you apply more water on the, after sowing because the pellet uh, material is absorbing the water and then it's falling apart. And actually, if you check it within 24 hours, all the pellets should be start to dissolve or start to, start to break uh, more or less open so that you can see that uh, there is fine dust around uh, the seed. And normally we say within tw uh, two days, it should be completely dissolved so that the, the germination part can, can start. If after two days, you still see very intact and hard pellets, that's a signal that you didn't apply enough water after sowing. So the next time that you make a sowing, mm -hmm. that you add extra water to fully dissolve uh, the pellet within the two days, and the shorter the better, but in general we say as a general rule, within two days all the pellets should be uh, open. And, 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 if, and we have a pencil test. If you take a small pencil and, and you tip on it, mm -hmm. it should fall apart. That's actually uh, very 
uh, effective way to test if, if the pellet is dissolved, uh, yes or no. And what about the moisture level after the first level? I think what the question means is, uh, in general, to start with, we start with the level five. Mm -hmm. We have a moisture scale from one to five, where one is completely dry, five, then the soil is fully saturated, so then it cannot absorb any water anymore. For begonias, uh, the recommendation is to start with level five, uh, so that's fully saturated, so that the, the pellet can dissolve, can absorb the water, and, and, and the seed itself can absorb the water, because that's really important for uh, the germination process, that the dry seed absorbs water, which starts up the germination process. For begonias, is, it's slightly different compared to other plants. In, in uh, normal plants, you have the germination, the root comes out, and then the cotyledons come out, and the plant starts to develop the normal true leaves. That's how we call it. With begonia, the first root is not coming out. It's firstly developing the cotyledons, then it starts to develop the first true leaf, and then it starts to, to uh, root into the soil. So actually, normally when you have the cotyledons developed, you start backing off the water, so you keep it drier to prevent algae, to prevent, uh, to stimulate root development. With begonias, it's slightly different. You need to wait longer. You need to keep the soil moist, and moist means in this case level four, maybe maximum level 4.5. Don't keep it saturated. Saturated is only the moment directly after sowing, and then you mm -hmm. reduce it to 4.5, four, uh, and when it's four, you water it up to level 4.5 again, and you, so that you keep it uniformly moist, but not saturated. And when the first true leaf is developed, uh, and you know that the seedling is going to develop the roots, then you start step-by-step step drying back to level 4, 3.5, 3. You follow, actually, the roots, how deep it's going into yeah. the, the plug, and that determines when to water it. If you keep it moist all the time, and then you know what problem you get. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we're going back to um, Shaq in the greenhouse. Yeah. To continue with number two, and that's the talk of the town. We're talking about impatience beacon. When uh, downy mildew killed the plants and so the market in the mid 90s, Impatience was, uh, I think, belonging to the top three selling items of almost every breeding company in the world. And so it was for Pan Am. That's why uh, everyone in the world is so excited about the introduction of our award-winning Beacon Series last season. Because this one offers a very high resistant against, uh, resistance sorry, against this downy mildew. We came to market last year with uh, six colors that you see lined out here, the white, the red, the salmon, the coral, and the violet, as well as two mixtures, a red and white mix, and the formula mix. And this year, like uh, Jeroen also explained in the, in the video earlier, we uh, introduced the much-wanted rose color, which makes it now uh, seven colors and two mixtures. For the growers, uh, it comes available in uh, film-coated seeds or coated seeds uh, to provide an easier sowing. And uh, I think that's for the impatience, for the growers, uh, a great step because uh, now they can be confident again to bring back this uh, versatile uh, impatience back into their production. Thank you very much, Any Jack. questions? I do have a question. What about more colors in the future and mixtures in the future? Can you tell me something about that? Yeah, I can tell you. Uh, there is uh, hard work being done uh, to make uh, new colors and to come up with new colors. Uh, what I can not promise you, but uh, there is a big chance that we will have some new mixtures next year to be added. And then hopefully next year or the year after next year, we hope to come with some separate colors too. Sounds lovely. Thank you. Um, we have to stop due to time limits, so I'm uh, going to thank you all for your expertise on the topic. Shaq, Leon, 
And Diego, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, the viewer, for asking all your questions. Be sure to um, check in again tomorrow because there will be a live stream again. We're going to discuss different topics. We're going to show a lovely new plants again. So I hope you are there tomorrow. And um, that's it for now. Have a great day.